Before we continue our look at the words of Jesus that reveal the biblical importance of fruit, it is important that we recognize an important and logical fact. Imagine that I told you that in order to get from point A to point B in my car, you would need to turn the key. This is true, because without turning the key, the car will not start. What if I also told you that you need to get into the car through the door? This is also true, right? Because if you're not in the car, you won't go very far. I could also add that you need to press the gas pedal to get from point A to point B in the car. Or I could say that you might need to occasionally press the brake pedal as well. You will also need to steer, use turn signals, use the mirrors, and do several other things to get from point A to point B in the car. These things are not contradictory. They all work together in what we call driving a car. Now, if I oversimplify the process, and I told you that you only had to turn the key, I have not accurately conveyed to you how all the various aspects of driving a car work. It is a mistake to oversimplify something that has many different and critical aspects like driving a car, and this mistake is frequently how the Bible is taught in terms of salvation. Instead of oversimplifying, we must harmonize all that the Word of God is clearly saying to find out how it fits together, like our driving the car analogy. Then we can put things in the right order. In Matthew 10.22, Jesus told the disciples, He who endures to the end will be saved. And in Mark 8.34-38, he said, Whoever desires to come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. For whoever desires to save his life will lose it. But whoever loses his life for my sake and the gospels will save it. So, are we to endure to the end to be saved or lose our life for Christ's sake and the gospels to save it? The Bible fits perfectly together. So when it speaks on a particular subject like salvation, it is rarely or because it is generally and. Part of being saved according to Jesus is enduring to the end and laying down our lives for the Lord's sake and the gospels. These principles are not how our salvation begins, but they are all part of it, like steering, braking, turning are all part of driving a car. In Mark 16, 16, we read, He who believes and is baptized will be saved, but he who does not believe will be condemned. Believing and being baptized is like getting into the car and turning the key. They are how we begin our walk with Jesus. This is also explained in John 3, 16 through 18, when Jesus said, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whoever believes in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. For God did not send his Son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. He who believes in him is not condemned, but he who does not believe is condemned already, because he has not believed in the name of the only begotten Son of God. Here Jesus makes it clear that anyone who does not believe on him is already condemned because it is like they never got into the car that he freely offered them. This is a key passage to remember, by the way, because like many other verses in the Bible, it reveals that folks who are following other religions instead of following Jesus are unfortunately already condemned. Modern relativistic thinking has led many to think that there are many different ways to heaven to be with the Father, but Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except 
through me. Jesus didn't leave any room for doubt. You must follow him in this life if you expect to live forever with him in eternity. So Jesus is the only way to God, and believing in him is the first step in our journey with him. That means that in our analogy, Jesus is like the car, and repentance and faith are like getting into the car. God did not owe us this amazing offer. We have all sinned against him, and we went our own way, but in his great love and kindness, Jesus put on human flesh to live a perfect life and die in our place on the cross so we could be saved from an eternity of separation from him. This is called grace, which simply means unmerited kindness. In Ephesians 2, 8 through 10, Paul explains, For by grace you have been saved through faith, and that not of yourselves. It is the gift of God, not of works, lest anyone should boast. For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. Grace is the explanation of why God offers us this amazing gift of salvation. It was not because of anything that we did, but because of his loving kindness that he offers to rescue us from our sins. This means that once we get into the car and turn the key, we must remember God saved us. We did not save ourselves, so we cannot boast in our salvation. Paul also revealed a big part of why God saved us in this passage. As he said, we were created in Christ Jesus for good works. In Titus 2.14, Paul repeats this theme as he wrote that Jesus gave himself for us that he might redeem us from every lawless deed and purify for himself his own special people zealous for good works. So, to summarize, we are saved by grace through faith, for good works. This does not eliminate all of the other things that the Bible says about salvation, but it neatly summarizes these three key points. It describes the fact that we cannot boast in our salvation because it was by God's grace, and we simply continue in our salvation through faith, while the goal we should have in our salvation is good works that glorify our wonderful Savior. The doctrine of grace is meant to keep us humble before God. The doctrine of faith is to keep us dependent on God's strength and not our own. And the doctrine of good works is to keep us focused on obedience to God's word. These three important doctrines or foundational principles of Christianity are not mutually exclusive, and they work together like the various aspects of driving a car to keep us on track in our walk with the Lord. The way of salvation begins by God's grace through faith in Jesus, and it should always be headed in the direction of good works that glorify his holy name. This means that as we discuss what the Bible clearly teaches about good works. We are not denying the doctrines of grace or the doctrines of faith. We are simply looking at what the Bible plainly says about good works. Too many people look at these doctrines with an or in between them instead of an and. In Titus 3.8, Paul wrote, This is a faithful saying. And these things I want you to affirm constantly, that those who have believed in God should be careful to maintain good works. These things are good and profitable to men. Paul not only told Titus to constantly affirm careful maintenance of good works, Paul also devoted large parts of his letters to how the churches should do good works and stay away from all forms of evil. 
Here is why all of this matters in regards to the Sermon on the Mount and the words of Jesus. In Titus 3.14, Paul wrote, And let our people also learn to maintain good works to meet urgent needs that they may not be unfruitful. Last week we learned that fruit was a metaphor for works because Paul used that same wording as John the Baptist about bearing fruit worthy of repentance, but changed the word fruit to works. Here we see in Titus a confirmation of that meaning as Paul encourages good works that they may not be unfruitful. Paul perfectly understood what Jesus said would happen to unfruitful trees. All of this fits like a glove with how we saw John the Baptist describe fruits worthy of repentance as sharing, not bearing false witness, being content with our wages, and more. Fruit is a metaphor for works in the Bible, and every passage that discusses either one of them easily confirms this fact. With this understood, we will read again what Jesus said in Matthew 7, 15 through 21. Beware of false prophets who come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly they are ravenous wolves. You will know them by their fruits. Do men gather grapes from thorn bushes or figs from thistles? Even so, every good tree bears good fruit. But a bad tree bears bad fruit. A good tree cannot bear bad fruit, nor can a bad tree bear good fruit. Every tree that does not bear good fruit is cut down and thrown into the fire. Therefore, by their fruits you will know them. Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, shall enter the kingdom of heaven, but he who does the will of my Father in heaven. As we apply the concepts of works to the metaphor of fruit, we see that it fits perfectly with what this passage is saying. The word tree, by the way, is a metaphor for a person, which is why Jesus begins by explaining we can know a false prophet or false teacher by their fruits or works. If they obviously produce bad fruit or sinful works that are disobedient to God, they are not a good tree. But if they produce good fruit or do the will of our Heavenly Father, then they are a good tree. Jesus not only gave us a litmus test for a teacher or a prophet here, he also revealed some very vital principles about how important good fruit is. Jesus said that every tree that does not bear good fruit is cut down and thrown into the fire. Then just for the metaphorically challenged listeners and readers, he makes it plain, not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, shall enter the kingdom of heaven but he who does the will of my Father in heaven. The word here translated Lord actually means master in today's English. So we can read this as, not everyone who says to Jesus, Master, Master, will enter the kingdom of heaven. Only those who actually lived like he was their master and did the will of their heavenly Father. This is why every tree that does not bear good fruit will be recognized as a bad tree and they will be cut down and thrown into the eternal fire of hell. Jesus makes the importance of obedience extraordinarily clear all throughout his great sermon. But as he closes the Sermon on the Mount, he drives it home with heavy repetition and several different analogies to make sure no one misses it. God reveals his will that Jesus just said we must do in the Bible, which is why in James 1, 21 through 22, we read, Therefore, 
lay aside all filthiness and overflow of wickedness, and receive with meekness the implanted word, which is able to save your souls. But be doers of the word, and not hearers only, deceiving yourselves. We deceive ourselves if we claim that driving a car simply involves getting in and turning the key, and we deceive ourselves if we claim that we can simply hear and believe God's word without actually becoming doers of it. Not everyone who simply believes that Jesus is Lord will enter the kingdom of heaven, only those who do God's will. If we oversimplify Christianity into just a system of beliefs, we have deceived ourselves. And James would say to those who have deceived themselves, you believe that there is one God, you do well. Even the demons believe and tremble. But do you want to know, O oh foolish man, that faith without works is dead? Much of the church today teaches by grace through faith, but they miss the importance of actually becoming obedient doers of God's word, and their faith is unfortunately dead. Other groups in the church skipped over grace and faith, and they try to earn salvation with man-made works, not done in the power of the Holy Spirit. All oh, while listening to the doctrines and traditions of men instead of the word of God. This group's works are like filthy rags in the sight of God. And still other groups have made doing God's will in faith, hope, and love as commanded in his word, optional, and claim that bearing fruit matters only for rewards, but they are also self-deceived. Jesus did not say that any tree that doesn't bear good fruit will be cut down and placed into lower rewards levels in heaven. He said, cast into the fire. Bearing fruit in our salvation that came by grace through faith is very, very important. And even though it flows from our communion with Jesus in prayer and the word, it is a choice that we must be reminded to make. In John 5, 28 through 29, Jesus said, Do not marvel at this, for the hour is coming in which all who are in the graves will hear his voice and come forth, those who have done good, to the resurrection of life, and those who have done evil, to the resurrection of condemnation. In other words, those who bore bad fruit will face a resurrection of condemnation, but those who bore good fruit will enjoy a resurrection of life. This is what Jesus means when he said, trees with no good fruit will be thrown into the fire. In Romans 2, 5 through 1, Paul writes, God will render to each one according to his works. Eternal life to those who by patient continuance in doing good seek for glory, honor, and immortality. But to those who are self-seeking and do not obey the truth, but obey unrighteousness, indignation and wrath, tribulation and anguish on every soul of man who does evil, of the Jew first and also of the Greek, but glory, honor, and peace to everyone who works what is good, to the Jew first and also to the Greek, for there is no partiality with God. Here Paul repeats the pattern taught by Jesus and makes it plain that doing good and working what is good is actually how we seek for glory, honor, and immortality. Paul adds that God will render to each one according to his deeds, which is the same as works in the original Greek. Paul is very clear. Just as Jesus was, we will be judged by our works committed in this life. Our old lives of sin were taken away through repentance and faith in Jesus. But in Christ, we were created to live a new life of obedience in faith, hope, and love in the power of the Spirit. 
by now, you should probably be asking yourself, if God will judge us based on our works, but Paul wrote so frequently against works in his letters, how can all of this fit together without any contradiction? In Galatians 2.16, Paul said, knowing that a man is not justified by the works of the law, but by faith in Jesus Christ, even we who have believed in Christ Jesus, that we might be justified by faith in Christ and not by works of the law, for by the works of the law, no flesh shall be justified. The works that Paul was adamantly opposed to were the works of the law that many in his day were seeking to be justified by. First, we have to define this word justification. Justified means to be declared righteous or cleared from all sin. Imagine our guilt was like a chalkboard with all our sins written all over it. And justification was God erasing the writing on the chalkboard through the cross of Christ. At the time of Paul, in the first century, people were used to doing sacrifices, ritual washing, circumcision, and other ceremonial outward things to be justified. And these were the works of the law. Just as Paul said, no one is justified by the works of the law, but by faith in Christ instead. That's why Paul also said in the same letter, For in Christ Jesus, neither circumcision nor uncircumcision avails anything but faith working through love. The works of the law, like circumcision, don't matter, but faith working through love does. Of these Mosaic customs, Hebrews 9.10 reveals that they were concerned only with food and drinks, various washings and fleshly ordinances imposed until the time of Reformation. That time of Reformation was when Jesus came and put away those ceremonial works of the law that were always pointing toward him. From then on, Relying on those things instead of relying on Jesus to provide our cleansing from sin was to misunderstand the gospel. And that was what Paul was correcting in Romans and Galatians. As a former Pharisee, these were the things that Paul was very familiar with. And as an apostle of Jesus Christ, he knew they were leading people toward the wrong covenant and away from trusting in Jesus as their only true and perfect sacrifice for sin. Just like we started off with an analogy of a car, Jesus taught all of these things using a different type of analogy. In John 15, 1 through 10, he said, I am the true vine, and my Father is the vine dresser. Every branch in me that does not bear fruit, he takes away. And every branch that bears fruit, he prunes that it may bear more fruit. You are already clean because of the word which I have spoken to you. Abide in me, and I in you. As the branch cannot bear fruit of itself unless it abides in the vine, neither can you unless you abide in me. I am the vine, you are the branches. He who abides in me and I in him bears much fruit. For without me, you can do nothing. If anyone does not abide in me, he is cast out as a branch and is withered, and they gather them and throw them into the fire, and they are burned. If you abide in me, and my words abide in you, you will ask what you desire, and it shall be done for you. By this my Father is glorified that you bear much fruit, so you will prove to be my disciples. As the Father loved me, I also have loved you. Abide in my love. If you keep my commandments, you will abide in my love, just as I have kept my Father's commandments, and abide in his love. Jesus used the concept of a vine and the branches to teach what we have been learning this morning. 
and he explains every branch that does not bear fruit, the Father takes away. This is very similar to what we saw in the Sermon on the Mount when Jesus said every tree that does not bear good fruit is cut down and thrown into the fire. And Jesus adds that every branch that bears fruit, the Father prunes, so it will bear more fruit. This concept is more deeply explained in Hebrews 12, which says, My son, do not despise the chastening of the Lord, that we may be partakers of his holiness. Now, no chastening seems to be joyful for the present, but painful. Nevertheless, afterward, it yields the peaceable fruit of righteousness to those who have been trained by it. God will prune his true branches so they will bear the fruit of righteousness so that we might be partakers of his holiness with him. Then Jesus explains to the 11 faithful apostles after Judas left that they were already clean because of the word that was spoken to them. They were made clean or justified by receiving the Lord's words in faith. And Jesus commands his 11 disciples to abide or remain in him. This simply means that the apostles were in Jesus because they received his word and faith. And he told them to stay or remain in him. This tells us that we can choose to stay in Christ or not. And this is done, according to several passages in the Bible, by keeping his commands. Next, Jesus tells them the most important part for our study today. As the branch cannot bear fruit of itself unless it abides in the vine, neither can you unless you abide in me. This is the point that we need to remember in regards to bearing fruit. We cannot bear any true good fruit unless we're abiding in the vine by grace through faith. This way, all of the fruit that we bear comes through the vine and by the vine and not by our independent efforts. Then we will correctly give Jesus Christ all of the well-deserved glory for the fruit that he's bearing through us. We are grafted into the vine by receiving the Lord's message and sacrifice in faith. And we are kept by faith. So all of this amazing plan was accomplished by God's grace. This means that when we bear fruit, it was because we were connected to the vine, who is Christ our Savior. And it will be true, good fruit done in faith that will lead to glory, honor, and immortality. Done in this way, the fruit is done in the power of God and not from us. And we remain humbly dependent on God. The vine and the branches of John 15 is the biblical metaphor we need to fundamentally understand because bearing fruit is not opposed to salvation by grace through faith. It is an inextricable part of it. That is why Jesus said, if anyone does not abide in me, he is cast out as a branch and is withered. And they gather them and throw them into the fire and they are burned. Just like trees that don't bear good fruit, the branch that doesn't remain in the vine to bear good fruit will be cast out and thrown into the fire. By God's grace, we can receive the word of God in faith, repent of our rebellion against him, and be grafted into the vine of Christ. Then we daily choose to walk after the spirit and abide in the vine, or walk after the flesh and neglect our great salvation. The end of walking after the flesh is clear, and we must preach the whole counsel of God, no matter how unpopular it is, so everyone can make a fully informed choice about their eternal destiny. We don't want anyone who knows us to say, Lord, Lord, on that terrible day of judgment, and hear Jesus say, Why do you call me Lord, Lord? and not do the things that I say.